Welcome. I'm Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure it is to be back home among, uh, among so many friends. I was telling members of the LBJ library staff and the LBJ foundation staff, I'm like a bad cold. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> Before we get started tonight, uh, I have a few things by way of housekeeping. The first is I want to thank our generous friend sponsors, St. David's Healthcare, the Moody Foundation, and Tito's Handmade Vodka. We very much appreciate your support of the Friends of the LBJ Library. Thank you. Later this week, on March 1st and 2nd, the LBJ Library is participating in a citywide giving campaign, Amplify Austin. Our goal here at the library is to raise $5,000 for bus scholarships to provide LBJ library field trips to students from underserved Texas schools. This is a wonderful cause, and we would ask that you consider making an online donation, however small, uh, to help. Tonight, we'll be treated to the premiere of Hulu's upcoming 10-episode series, The Looming Tower, based on Lawrence Wright's Pulitzer Prize-winning book of the same name, which will be sold in the lobby after the program. In a moment, Larry will come out to cue the episode, and I will just warn you quickly, there is some very, very harsh language. Uh, you can all take it, I assure you, but I just wanted to give you fair warning. Um, also, the, the credits will roll afterward, and then you're gonna see a preview of upcoming issues. After that, we, uh, the, the screening will last 52 minutes, and afterwards, I'll moderate a conversation with Larry. Ali Soufan, the former FBI supervisory agent, who was depicted throughout the series and was a pivotal player in this story, as you'll see. And actor Michael Stuhlbarg, who portrays Richard Clark, White House counterterrorism officer. Michael is on a bit of a hot streak right now. He's had roles in three films that have been nominated for the Academy Award Best Picture, including The Shape of Water, The Post, and Call Me By Your Name. It's my Pleasure to introduce our fellow Austinite, Larry Wright, a renowned author, screenwriter, playwright, and staff writer for The New Yorker magazine. His book, The Looming Tower, Al-Qaeda and the Road to 9-11, was published over a decade ago to international acclaim. In addition to winning the Pulitzer Prize, the book spent eight weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list and has been translated into 25 languages. Larry is an old friend of this institution, in 2006, he was on this stage to preview, preview rather, his one-man play, My Trip to Al-Qaeda, which he later took to Manhattan for the New Yorker Festival. And he returned here in 2015 to discuss his best-selling book, Going Clear, which he also later co-produced as a documentary for HBO. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend, Larry Wright. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's very meaningful to, for me to be here in Austin, where I live, um, and have been coming to this library. We moved here in 1980, and we've been coming here and been members for 38 years. Um, so this, this institution and this city means a lot to us. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, the Looming Tower. The book uh, really began uh, on 9-11, uh, and I was um, in, in our house uh, trying to decide how to uh, get into this story. If you remember back then, uh, the planes were grounded and I couldn't get to New York. So I was reading obituaries that were streaming online and looking for some way to find a story to tell that would bring this vast human tragedy down to human level. And on the Washington Post site, I found an obituary for John O'Neill. And he was the uh, head of counterterrorism for the FBI in New York at the time. And the obituary made him seem like something of a disgrace because he had taken classified information out of the office. And he had been let go from the Times, from the, from the FBI. And he became the head of security 
at the World Trade Center. And so my reaction on reading that was, so he didn't get bin Laden, bin Laden got him. And how ironic. And the more I learned about John O'Neill, who is played in this episode uh, by Jeff Daniels, uh, the more I realized that it wasn't ironic, it was Greek in its tragedy. Uh, his friends told him, John, you'll be safe now. They already tried to attack the, you know, they did attack the World Trade Center in 1993. And he said, no, they'll come back to finish the job. So he instinctively placed himself at ground zero. Uh, Ali Safan uh, came into my life indirectly uh, when I was researching a movie I co-wrote called The Siege uh, with Denzel Washington, who actually held the job that John O'Neill, in the movie that John O'Neill held in real life. But Ali Safan was undercover, and I heard about this young Lebanese-American FBI agent, so I wrote a, a part that Tony Shalhoub plays in, in the film. And then, uh, just three years later, 9-11 happened, and I began researching the book, and, uh, and I got to meet Ali Soufan, and uh, come to realize how, what a great debt of gratitude the American people owe to him for being the one who uncovered the names of the hijackers, the one who unmasked Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as the mastermind of 9-11. There's so much more about Ali Safan that we can talk about later, but uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of that background and hope you can appreciate this young um, French-Algerian writer, uh, actor named Tahar Rahim uh, plays Ali, and uh, I think uh, he's, he's just, it's gonna be a breakout role for him. All of these actors are terrific. I love them. And uh, so I hope that you'll come to appreciate them somewhat as much as I do. And I'll, I'll talk to you after this, this show, but thank you so much for coming. Bye. Well, welcome and congratulations. Thank you. This is a, an extremely compelling premiere to the series. I'm, I can't wait to see the rest, but I'm sure my audience agrees. Um, Larry, let me start with you. You talked a little bit about the genesis of this book as you were uh, queuing up the, yeah. the episode. H how do you tackle a subject this big? Uh, when you're watching 9-11 play out, you get this idea to do this book, but where do you begin? Well, when I tell a story that's a complicated story, I always look for individuals who, they don't have to be famous or, you know, even, you know, very attractive, you know, but they have to be able to convey information to the reader or the viewer. And I call these donkeys. I know it sounds disparaging, but a donkey is a, is a very useful beast of burden. He can carry a lot of information on his back. And, uh, and also he can take the the reader or the viewer into a world that he's never been in before. And for instance, John O'Neill, when I found that obituary, mm. uh, I didn't know if he was a hero or a goat, but I thought he's a hell of a donkey. He can take us into the world of counterterrorism and show us why it failed. Mm. And so he was the very first person I seized on. And then, you know, I, the other characters, uh, the book itself is, uses uh, O'Neill, and, uh, and Ayman al-Zawahiri, the, now the head of al-Qaeda, and bin Laden, and Prince Turki al-Faisal, who was the head of Saudi intelligence uh, and worked with bin Laden. And, uh, and, and these interweaving biographies became the spine of the looming tower. So as you were doing the research, what revelation most took you aback? Well, it, it involves Ali. Uh, you know, when I met Ali, um, the, uh, I had a lot of questions about uh, what did the intelligence community know uh, about the plot. And um, Ali was, uh, he was a case agent for the USS Cole in uh, bombing in 2000. And um, while he was interrogating uh, these figures in Yemen, he began to uncover 
information about a meeting in Malaysia and money that had flowed to Malaysia during a time when normally money comes to an operation. Why was it going out of the country? And, you know, there's a meeting in Kuala Lumpur, and he suspected maybe this, has, maybe this is where the operation was planned. And indeed, that was true. Uh, what he didn't know, couldn't have known then, is that at that meeting there were two future hijackers. And um, so he queried the CIA on three occasions, asking for information. Do you know anything about a meeting that was in Malaysia? And they said, no. We don't, you know, they, they, they spurned it. Not only did they know about it, they got the Malaysian authorities to surveil it. They got photographs of all the participants. And two of those people were, flew to LA in January of 2000, 19 months before uh, 9-11. And the, and the CIA found out about it in March of 2000. All of that time, they knew that Al-Qaeda was in America. And, and they failed to tell the FBI, which was legally entitled to have that information, already had an indictment on bin Laden, could legally follow them, clone their computers, whatever. You know, they could have, they could have disrupted the plot, right. but they were in the dark until it's too late. Uh, Ali, first of all, how's it feel to be a donkey? <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> uh, you, you were, uh, this dovetails nicely into something you said last night. Uh, Larry threw up a, a party last night and, and we had a chance to hear from Ali. And you said you were trepidatious about this story coming to the screen. But ultimately you wanted to see it made because of accountability. Talk, talk about that, what, what did you mean by that? One Larry and Alex uh, talked to me about this. It, it, it was very awkward for me to be involved in a drama about 9-11. 9-11 is extremely important, sacred uh, event uh, for me. I lost friends. Uh, and, and it's also more than that. It's also an indication of how we collectively failed the American people uh, and this tragedy happened. So I prefer something like this to be a documentary rather than a drama. And I had to think about it. And, um, but also at the same time, I know that this story has been um, written, this story has been told. Everything that Larry said is part of not only his book, but many documents that have been declassified over the years by the intelligence community. And, and the folks who did this uh, stayed true to the story. So that was extremely important. That's number one. Number two, even though story have been told, but it hasn't been shown to the American people. And I think there's a big difference. And I felt that 16 years, 17 years after 9-11, we still don't have closure. And in order to do closure, we need to have understanding, and we need to have clarity, and we need to have characters like Michael and Jeff Daniels, and you know, people bring it to life so the American people can finally understand all the tragic events, the personalities, the institutional pickering that end up, you know, <laughs> We call it that tragic Tuesday of, of 9-11. Um, unfortunately, after all these years also, we never had an accountability uh, on 9-11. I mean, we, uh, uh, the closest we get to an accountability is the CIA's own Inspector General report, where they pointed fingers at their own director and a few other people in the agency um, and uh, required them to be held accountable uh, for the 3,000 American death that took place on 9-11. Uh, the summary of this report has been, has been declassified and um, has been published uh, by, uh, by the intelligence community and by the agency. So um, if we never had accountability because of that, if in a legal sense, uh, we might have an accountability in a, a cultural uh, sense, mm -hmm. in a public sense. And I think that's what I hope this show is gonna do because accountability is extremely important. You know, we thought if 3,000 Americans uh, are murdered, um, we're gonna have an accountability. But the people who were supposed to be held accountable gave the administration back then what they wanted. They gave them a false link about WMD and about war in Iraq, and, and we end up going to Iraq. And if we never had an accountability because of the Iraq war, uh, because of all the thousands of people who were killed from our side, and actually, frankly, from the Iraqi side. Mm. The Iraq war messed up the whole Middle East. You just look at the map today. If we never had an accountability for that, we thought definitely we might have an accountability because of 
you know what? Torture because of the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. We are, after all, the United States of America. We fight for justice. We fight for human rights. We fight for the right thing. We are the shining city on the hill. But guess what? We never had accountability for that either. Mm -hmm. So legally, we're not gonna have an accountability. And I think a lot of countries are basically getting used to the fact that there is no accountability in America to include President Putin himself and look about the actions, their interference in our election, in our mm. political system. So maybe if politicians don't want to do accountability, let us try to do an accountability. Let us show what happened to the American yeah. people. Let us change the world we live in. Let's change our mind about our system. Because if we don't change our mind, guess what? We're not changing anything about our future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, congratulations not only on the looming tower, but on uh, what has to be described as a breakout year. <laughs> it's just yeah. this, it's an astounding year for uh, an actor. So congratulations Thank on you. all that you've achieved this year. So clearly, you picked the right projects and 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 enhanced them. Yeah. What led you to this one? Danny Futterman, mm. uh, our showrunner. Uh, I had known Danny in New York City as actors. We are contemporaries, we're the same age. And I got an email from him saying, uh, there's a project I'm working on, we're thinking of you for playing this role. Um, uh, Mr. Richard Clark. And um, I, uh, I had seen Mr. Clark interviewed on Jon Stewart's Daily Show. <laughs> and he made a, a really, a really strong impression for me. He was a man who was coming out and telling the truth, and he was taking responsibility for uh, our government's failure at a time when we all really needed to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of flabbergasted because I didn't think of myself being uh, right for the part. Hmm. But I weighed it, and then I got another email from one of our writers, Bashiba Dorn, who had written for Boardwalk Empire, a show that I had been on hmm. before. And she also said, this is going to be something very special. Please consider this. She's throwing her two cents in as well. Um, and then learning about The Looming Tower, the, the novel, learning about Larry, learning about Alex Gibney, um, learning about the cast that they were assembling, and the challenge that it was going to be. But Danny also said to me that most likely you will get to say some of the things that Richard said in front of the 9-11 Commission mm -hmm. as well. And that kind of pushed me over the edge to think, wow, an opportunity <laughs> to get to actually speak the things that uh, our government, that, that people needed to hear. Yeah. Um, so I, I took a leap of faith. And I'm so, so glad that I did. We are, too. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly it benefited the project. Uh, uh, when you are choosing a role, any role, what goes through your mind? What, 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 what are the factors that lead you to, I mean, you've mentioned that this role specifically, but generally speaking, what are the factors that go through your mind when you say, yeah, I've got to do this? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, beggars can't be choosers, to be completely honest with you. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's more along the lines of what comes towards me, mm -hmm. what somebody else thinks I might be able to do. Um, I had nothing to do with fighting for the role that I ended up playing in Call Me By Your Name, yeah. or in The Shape of Water, uh, or in The Post. Yeah. They all just kind of fell in my lap. Um, so I, I took these opportunities and I ran with them. Generally, if I have a choice in the matter, uh, it's something that engages my mind, something that is obviously smart, uh, more often with a sense of humor, because that's kind of how I see the world. Um, and just something that sort of says, either you can do this, or you should do this, or I'm terrified to do this. Mm. Uh, all of those things kind of combined, ideally, would be a wonderful project to throw myself into. So. Uh, I've just had a, I've, I've, I've had a really, uh, I've, been a, I've been really lucky this year, so. Uh, Larry, uh, you work in many mediums. Uh, unlike a lot of historians, you work easily on the stage. You, you have done many things relating to the screen. You've written books. 
Uh, what was the challenge in bringing this book to the small screen? Well, one thing is the sc small screen isn't as small as it used to be. Yeah, it, it, you know, there's a lot more expanse and uh, you know, the, the ability to tell a story in such a broad canvas uh, wasn't present when I published the book. Um, the, um, the first problem we faced was where to start. Mm. You know, the book actually begins in, you know, with Saeed Qutb's journey to America in 1948. Uh, he was the man who uh, went back to Egypt and wrote uh, Malam Fil Tariq, this book called Milestones, uh, that was the book that bin Laden and everybody read that, you know, how often it always goes back to a book. Well, this was the Mein Kampf of uh, the Islamist movement. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was smuggled out of prison, and uh, it electrified uh, a generation of, of young Muslims who were so alienated and disoriented in their own cultures. The story of you know, the rise of bin Laden and you know, his boyhood and, and Zawahri, all of that is the prehistory mm -hmm. and occupies about 300 pages that we don't deal with. Um, and I, I'm, one day I'd love to tell that story in the same form. I think it would be quite fascinating to talk about how these cultures diverged and um, and came to come came to collision in the way that they are now. So we decided that uh, we should begin with the embassy bombings, where you see this. Right. Uh, and the reason was, uh, for one thing, we knew that that Ali was going to be a, a big part of it, uh, and this really introduces him to us. Uh, also, Americans weren't aware of Al-Qaeda until 9-11. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to show that we'd been under attack uh, for three years before 9-11, beginning with the embassy bombings, which killed 224 USS people. USS Cole. Cole bombing, <laughs> where you know, 17 sailors were killed. Uh, and, and that was in October of 2000 right in the middle of the presidential campaign, and not a single question about terrorism was raised in the presidential debates, which shows you how distant uh, that concern was from any American. Uh, it was happening somewhere else. And so when 9-11 happened on our shores, that's why you know, it was so unsettling, because where did this come from? Well, you know, a few people like Ali Soufan knew what was going on and we're trying to protect us. And that's the story we decided we have to begin there and show the, the conflict of people inside these agencies with each other and also within their own agencies to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Because really in the, both the bureau and the agency, they, uh, people were seen as kind of fanatics or you know, off the deep end. Um, the, uh, in the Alex station, you know, um, one of my CIA friends used to call it the island of lost toys. <laughs> you know, they were discards from other departments that had been thrown in there. Uh, so nobody took it seriously except for the people that you see depicted in this. And the war that they were fighting, unfortunately, they were also fighting against each other. What did you make of Al Qaeda before 9 11? Well, you know, I was researching the yeah. siege. And so um, I had some unhappy experience. Uh, I. Uh, the movie came out in August of 1998. Well, it came out in November of 98, but the trailers came out in, right after the embassy bombings. And there's a, there was another bombing that took place that same month that people don't hear very much about uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. Mm -hmm. And it was of a planet Hollywood. Uh, two people were killed. A little girl lost her leg. And the it, radical Islamist group that claimed credit for it said they were protesting the siege, uh, which had, you know, they only had heard rumors of the trailer in America, which had not been, but two people were dead, mm -hmm. and, the pe and the movie hadn't even come out yet. So I had been writing about, you know, an Islamist terror group, and the movie, when it came out in November, was, there were protesters, there were pickets around the theaters. It was a box office failure. Uh, people were afraid to go to the movie. Mm. And uh, so I was very <laughs> aware of the conflict, uh, you know, nat internationally and also in my own country. 
uh, about you know radical Islam and where it was going. Uh, Ali, I, I, uh, I, we see that scene, that harrowing scene of you arriving in Albania. What is it like to see your life flash before you on screen? Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, weird in so many different ways when you, you know, you're, you're staring at aspect of your life and sometimes it's really doesn't bring some good memories, you know, uh, but, uh, but I think, um, I think they they stayed uh, true to the story. Now there is dramatization. I won't be jumping off roof. You know, if I saw, if a guy running like this, I'll be like, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for him on the other side of the block, right? Uh, but that's usually. Uh, but yeah, it's you know the uh, as you've seen in the first episodes, like uh, the very first hard drive with the Mabruk, uh, the uh, Albania operation. Uh, the East Africa embassy bombings, all these things, uh, where basically you can Google them and you'll see that these events actually took place and happened. And uh, yes, uh, it was put to the public in a dramatized version, but the story is, is true. Is it a temptation to, to look at it and say, no, it didn't quite happen that way, or, or you're getting this wrong? And what, what, how do you suspend that, that Impulse. It, well, it's 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 very difficult. I mean, it's you're talking about a drama, and this, you know, this is this is a game. You know, uh, I mean, uh, if you don't do a lot of drama, you know, the the showrunners and you know the directors will be attacked. Oh, they didn't do much drama in it. You know, people are anticipating that. But uh, one of the things that I really loved about this story that it's it stayed true to the facts. And that was extremely important. Yet yeah, definitely, somebody like me is going to look back, well, you know, this, this, and that. But uh, towards the end, uh, these small little things probably will matter to me uh, mm. because that's my life. But does it really matter to an individual who's watching and trying to get the point of what really happened? Right. I mean, you have an episode where you have to take years and years of operations, uh, intelligence collections, bickering, uh, you know, human beings fighting with each other and using their own institutions and the culture of uh, their own institution as a tool in order to win their own personal battles. You have a lot of these things happening, but in the same time, you have to convey it all to a person who's going to watch everything in about 50 minutes. And I think the show did a phenomenal job in bringing the emotions out uh, that existed uh, at the time, yeah. uh, a lot of it. Uh, while you all were watching the film, uh, we were, I was giving a tour of the library to our guests and uh, showed a letter uh, that uh, Jacqueline Kennedy had written LBJ, which informed Brian Cranston's portrayal of LBJ. But Michael, you have portrayed two real life characters in the last year, one of whom is alive, Richard Clark. And you spent some time with him. How did the time you spent with Clark inform your portrayal of him? Um, Larry hooked us up together. We connected and we went out to dinner together. Uh, he was kind enough to let me record our uh, conversation so I would have his voice to listen to in the future. But uh, there's so much out there on the internet of him giving speeches in a number of different situations and testimony as well. So it's readily accessible. He has become even more of a public figure since that time. So there's a lot of information out there for him. Generally, um, uh, his generosity made me feel relaxed a little bit more than I was going into the situation. Um, I was in the middle of another job at the time, so I hadn't had the time to do the research I needed to do to ask him intelligent questions. <laughs> so I was saying really stupid things to him. So basically, I, it was an opportunity to sit across from him, to listen, to ask questions if he brought up a subject that I hadn't thought about, to hear about his inspirations as a young man to get into government, what 30 years in government was like, working under four presidents. Mm. Um, uh, why he, why he, why he does what he does. Um, all of that was stuff that I wouldn't have found necessarily in his book or uh, on the internet. Um, it was I primarily took away his uh, uh, a great sense of humor mm. um, uh, uh, of someone who has had their hands 
in our foreign policy and our world for the last 30 years, and I'm very uh, grateful. grateful. Was there one thing, big or small, that, that said, yeah, I got him, I, I understand him now? Huh. No. <laughs> no, I mean, he's a lot to, to take in. Yeah. To be completely honest with you, he's, he's lived lives, you know, the things he's done are things I could only imagine. And uh, uh, I, it, it, um, it did spark my imagination, though, mm. to, to try to put myself in his shoes when he's uh, out there having a hand in, in basically who lives and dies. Yeah. Um, that's an experience I've never had, and uh, uh, it's amazing to sit across the table from somebody who has had such influence. So it's been a, a great challenge. And uh, he was very generous. Yeah. Ali, Larry, uh, front and center in this story is the dysfunction between the FBI and the CIA, uh, much to the detriment of the nation, if not the world. We now live in an era where our commander in chief uh, has put those agencies under attack. He's called our DNI, our former DNI, James Clapper, former CIA director, John Brennan, and former. Uh, FBI Director Jim Comey, political hacks. What does that do to our standing abroad? When, when, the, when the, the, our intelligence apparatus is under siege in that manner, what is the threat to this nation? My feeling is that threat, it, the greater threat is to ourselves, not to our standing <laughs> abroad. Um, if there's a lesson that you want to take, that you might want to take from this, uh, this series, it is divided we fail. I mean, you see the division, you know what happened. You can see that it might not have happened if we had been united, if we had been at one purpose. And now uh, the intelligence community is reorganized and it's doing a far better job of cooperating with each other than on 9-11 and we do, our relationship with foreign services is far, much better than it was back then. But the division inside our country is profound, uh, maybe as great as it's ever been in modern history. And the demonization of our intelligence community for partisan reasons mm -hmm. is a, a way of sowing division, which is aided and abetted by foreign agencies like the Russians, and make, in widening this chasm. Well, if there's a lesson that we should take from 9-11 in this series is that it's dangerous. It's dangerous to, to create that kind of division. And, and when we do that, we place ourselves at peril. And so I fault the political people in our country who are attacking our intelligence agencies simply for partisan reasons because they're placing us in danger in doing that. Ali was the... Was 9-11, uh, this might be a, a rhetorical question, but was 9-11 a catalyst in, in seeing better cooperation between the FBI and the CIA? One of the things that I always say that this is not an issue, and even what happened with the events that led to 9-11, an issue between the CIA and the FBI. The people in the field we were working closely together. There was something, as you see, that happening on headquarters, on a headquarter level and uh, people decided not to share information. Um, when the CIA IG came out, or the 9-11 uh, commission came out, they pointed fingers at specific people, not at an entire agency. Um, I worked more with the CIA than probably with the FBI when I was in the field. And, um, and these people are really ready at any second to lay their lives for the sake of this country. Mm -hmm. uh, we never differentiate who's FBI and who's CIA when we're fi fighting the bad guys in Albania or in Nairobi or in Afghanistan or in Yemen, you call it. So we have to keep that in mind. And I support what Larry said about all of us being attacked. After 9-11, I think the relationship is a lot better. I think there are a lot of things that have been implemented that kind of prevent individuals uh, like Martin Schmidt, for example, mm. to utilize institutional culture in order to create uh, their own fiefdom inside any agency, in the FBI or in the CIA. So we're a lot better. But uh, also, at the same time, uh, we see today uh, all the heads of the intelligence agencies. I don't know if you saw the hearing a few weeks ago. 
uh, sitting and each one of them saying, yes, Russia interfered in our election in 2016. Yes, Russia is planning to interfere in the election of 2018. Um, this is a DNI that's you know, appointed by the current president, a CIA director that's appointed by a current president, the head of NSA, the uh, head of FBI that's also appointed by the current president. And each and every one of them, when they said, are you getting an instruction uh, to basically retaliate against the Russians? And each one of them said, no. See, we don't have deep state, regardless to what the president tweets. Mm -hmm. What we have is intelligence agencies that get, gets their orders from the commander in chief. And we are under attack today. And uh, you know, Al Qaeda attacked us to divide us, and they failed. But the Russians attacking us to divide us, and they are winning. And we're not retaliating. And we're not responding. And we're not holding them accountable. And they are not feeling the pain to stop. And our intelligence agencies, I believe, can inflict a lot of pain mm -hmm. on the Russians and others who are interfering or trying to interfere in our system. But the commander in chief need to acknowledge that it's not a hoax. Mm -hmm. And if they are not getting the orders, they're not going to respond. Mm -hmm. I know I'm pessimistic, but I hope shows like this will make more people uh, involved, um, more people going back and figuring out what happened and how we can hold people accountable. And uh, I think we're in the LBJ library, <laughs> so maybe we should say, and we shall overcome. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want this question to come off as though I'm asking if we have a bigger button, but um, we, have, we clearly have a, big. <laughs> a, a bigger military. Uh, we spend more money on, on defense than other countries. Are our intelligence agencies discernibly better than those of uh, uh, our, uh, uh, our, our enemies and our allies? Well, Ali would be a better... Absolutely, man. Yeah. We yeah. can smoke anyone. Yeah. We just need the orders. Yeah. But Absolutely. I'll, I'll take a little bit of issue with it. You know, I, uh, the capabilities that we have to in listen. one division in yeah. the CIA or the FBI is better, bigger, and more efficient than the capability a whole country has. We're the United States of America. We're the richest country in the world. If you put all the militaries of the world together, they are still smaller than our military. We are the United States of America. We can do it, but we need the political leaders to give us instructions to do it. And unfortunately, in the last 15, 20 years, we always get the wrong instructions. You know, instead of going after Al Qaeda, let's go under, after Saddam. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of doing it the right way, let's do Abu Ghraib. And uh, that's why we are in a debacle and we're going in a vicious cycle. We will be inviting you back when we need a pep talk. <laughs> um, I am the wrong person for it. You have a guy for a pep talk there. I'm just a donkey, remember? <laughs> <laughs> a donkey, but not an ass. <laughs> I am independent, by the way. Don't take it as a... <laughs> Michael, you are uh, clearly a, a master film actor, but it didn't come easy. Uh, you started on stage, and as I understand it, it took you a while to adapt to, to screen acting. Talk, talk about that process. Oh, <laughs> uh, gosh, yeah, I couldn't get a TV job to save my life. It took me 13 years to get a small part on Law & Order. In the meantime, I was doing plays in New York. That was my lifeblood. It's still in my blood. And um, um, yeah, it was hard. I guess I just had some growing up to do, honestly. Uh, and uh, I didn't understand the craft. And um, I had an opportunity to audition for the Coen Brothers in 2008 for their film, A Serious Man, a small part in their film. And, they didn't cast me in that small part, but they came back to me several months later and asked me to audition for the lead, and for some reason they cast me in it, and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it gave me an opportunity to spend two months on a film set for the first time in my life, and it was those two months that really just sort of gave me a kind of confidence. They, gave, they put confidence in me, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I could just do the work in a, in a way that I hadn't had the opportunity to do that before. Mm. And really, um, because they 
they put their faith in me, other people have put their faith in me, and I've had opportunities now that I would never have had before. So uh, uh, I just got, I got lucky. Yeah. Well deserved. Thanks. Uh, Larry, uh, before we leave, I, I have to ask, 9-11 was the most momentous um, event of this century. What do you worry most about now? Well, as you look around the world, I, you know, there, there are many, we have a diversity of threats, maybe more threats than we can possibly put our mind to. But if you just think about terrorism itself, you know, uh, when 9-11 happened, Al-Qaeda was what, like 400 guys? 400. Uh, there are thousands now. And we don't even think about Al-Qaeda, uh, but they're in multiple com countries. There are many chapters of Al-Qaeda. There, there are their progeny, like ISIS and Boko Haram, are, are there. We're, we're fighting against them, but they're still proliferating and spreading. And so many uh, foreign fighters going back into Europe and Russia. It's um, it's a very dangerous world. And the distraction that we're, I mean, just one tweet can capture the attention of, of you know, the whole country, uh, and take away, take our mind off of the fact that that we're in a dangerous world mm -hmm. and uh, that we need to support the people that are trying to protect us. And if we, if, and I, I, I worry oftentimes that we've forgotten who we are. Uh, this, you know, I, you know, all the things you cited about torture and have a grave and you know, we had two wars that we're still involved in. And, um, and it, I, I know I'm dating myself when I think about this, but I've, I often reflect on what America used to be. And the, the episode that comes to my mind is when I was in high school. I took my girlfriend to the airport on a date in Dallas. It's called Love Field, you know. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it was a place you could go when you didn't have any money to go to the movie. And so we went to the airport and we walked out on the tarmac and then climbed up into a jetliner that we had decided had just come from Paris. And uh, we sat in the first class section and stewardesses, as we called them then, brought us a snack. And uh, then we walked up in the FAA tower. Hi kids, come on in. And so we sat there and watched them landing the planes. <laughs> and um, that America's dead. And terrorism killed it. But if it's forgotten, then we will have lost something precious. And I, one of the reasons I wanted to do this series, I felt so many young people, 9-11 is not a part of their lived experience. They don't know why we're in the fix we're in now. They don't know about why we created the security state that we have, why we're engaged in these prolonged wars, uh, why we, we have so much conflict that uh, all sprang from the fear and the paranoia that gripped the country after 9-11. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our goal is to try to represent that progression. But my secret goal is to try to remind people that, you know, who we are and where we came from and try to navigate back to that. Because if we don't find that America again, then terrorists will have won. The, the Looming Tower debuts on Hulu tomorrow night. Uh, they will roll out the first three episodes, and then the seven subsequent episodes will be rolled out week by week. My congratulations to Larry Wright, to Michael Stubard, and to Ali Soufan. And please come back for a possible season two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you for coming.